Please take your Bibles and open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We've come together this morning, and if you're like me, you walked in and you noticed that right down here in front of the podium, there's a table set up with a bunch of gold dishes. And when you saw that our sanctuary was prepared for the Lord's table this morning, you probably immediately thought something. And what I want to get at right now is what was it that you thought when you saw those plates set up down there? What was the first thing that came to your mind? Well, if you like, if you are like I typically am, the first thing that comes to my mind when I see that we're prepared for the Lord's table is, oh boy, that's going to be one of those soul-searching mornings where I've got to, you know, do house cleaning and at the end of the service when Pastor Conley's done and right before we do the Lord's Supper, you know, I've got to think through my, the last... You know, month until the last Lord's Supper and make sure I haven't sinned against anybody and make sure all my sin accounts are, are kept short, you know, that there's nothing outstanding between Angie and me. And, you know, and, and I, I, I start going, you know, just might as well, just right off the service because i got to start working through, you know, my life over the last month. And I have to admit that typically when I've come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the word celebrate isn't the word that I've used in my thinking and in my experience. Uh, the word uh, condemning is probably a little more of what I experience and what I go through when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And I started thinking about that, and as I've begun studying the passage that I'm going to share with us this morning, I realized that that's, that's far from what God wants us to come together and do and leave feeling this morning. Maybe you don't feel condemned by the Lord's Supper, but maybe you feel a bit bored with it. You know that the service is going to take a little bit longer this morning because we have to go through the Lord's Supper um, details. You know that typically you'll hear Pastor Conley get up and when he, when he distributes the bread and distributes the juice and walks us through the Lord's Supper, it's typically the same kind of things that you hear over and over again. In fact, you could probably uh, fill him in on the words to use because you've heard it so many times. So during the Lord's Supper, once you've you know kind of take an inventory of your life and you think, okay, I think I've confessed all the sin that I'm aware of right now. At that point, you kind of check out mentally for the rest of the service, kind of thinking through the rest of the afternoon or maybe the rest of the week. You aren't sure exactly what you're supposed to think about during the Lord's Supper, so you just kind of take a little bit of a, of a mental and spiritual break. There's nice music playing and um, you know, you've got the, the juice or the cracker there in your hand and you're waiting for the service to be over. What is the intent? What's the purpose that, that Jesus Christ has for us in instituting the Lord's Supper. Well, that's what I want us to look at this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to actually read verses 17 all the way through 34. And I would ask that you would do your best to follow along and turn your attention to the words that God has for us this morning. Here Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he says, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Now think... Think if Pastor Conley stood before us this morning and said, when our church meets together, it's not for the better, but it's actually for the worse. I think our antenna would be up and we'd be listening to what he had to say. Verse 18, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night, on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the the body and blood of the Lord. These following verses are the ones that we typically hone in on during the Lord's Supper, or at least I historically have. Verse 28, let a person examine himself then and see, and, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things. I will give directions when I come. Let's pray. Father, I ask that by your spirit, you would illumine our minds to understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, my desire is to convince you that the Lord's Supper is a God-given physical reminder to keep our lives focused on the cross. If I have a a proposition statement or a thesis statement theme, that's it for this morning. To to get across the truth that the Lord's Supper is a God-given, Jesus Christ instituted, physical reminder to keep our lives focused on the cross. Paul starts his teaching on this subject by rebuking the Corinthian believers. He's already rebuked them earlier in the chapter. Maybe they're getting used to it. Paul's rebuking them. He says, uh, word has reached him that they are actually desecrating the Lord's Supper by their wicked selfishness. See, the early church was known to have uh, these, these meals together, and they were often even referred to as love feasts, at which the church would come together and they would, they would experience fellowship together. They would care for one another. They would eat a meal together, etc. At the close of these meals, often they would end with what we know as the Lord's Supper. And what Paul had gotten news of is that there was, there was sinfulness taking place right during this time of Christian fellowship. The wealthy people brought their food. And the poor people, who didn't have food to bring, came expecting to share with what food the wealthy had brought. But the wealthy brought their food and they maintained their distinction from the poor. They drank and gorged themselves on the food that they brought. And the poor came expecting to share but went away hungry. Paul heard about this and realized that this was despicable. And of course we read this passage and we think, well, yeah, that's despicable. If the church comes together, those who have more are to share with with those who have less. We all experience and have everything in common. As Pastor Conley has been uh, preaching on the church on Sunday nights. Paul is quick to point out in verse 20 that though... These believers, they're gathering together, they're eating a meal together, and then at the end of that meal, they're passing bread around and passing juice around. Though they're doing that, and they think they're having the Lord's Supper, Paul says in verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. You might be doing the physical act that looks like the Lord's Supper, but by your behavior, by your attitude, by your actions, you're proving that what you're doing isn't the Lord's Supper. You're eating bread and drinking juice, but you're not having the Lord's Supper. Because the Lord's Supper is not primarily about eating bread or drinking from the cup. It's about remembering and proclaiming the gospel. You say, really? Yeah, those are the words Paul uses, remembering and proclaiming. We'll look at that in a few minutes. The focus of Paul's concern is on this meal as a means of proclaiming Christ's death point that the Corinthians' action is obviously bypassing. Now, before we jump in to the the, the portion of Scripture that we're going to primarily focus on, verses 23 through 26, these first few verses where Paul is rebuking the Corinthian church, I think there are spiritual truths for us to gain and learn even from Paul's rebuke of them. Now, we aren't getting together regularly to eat meals, and when we do, we don't have a rich people section and a poor people section. When we do get together for things like potlucks, everybody shares. But I do think that there is spiritual truth for us to be gained in Paul's rebuke of the Corinthians. You see, we can gather as the body of Christ and assume that spiritual good is happening. Just like these folks did. But if our actions or our attitudes are not in keeping with the humble, servant-mindedness of Christ, we can potentially do more harm than good. You say, really? We can do more harm than good? Look at verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better. And why does the church come together? We come together to spiritually strengthen one another, to worship our Savior together. Paul said, that's not what's happening. In fact, when you come together, it's for the worse. You're being a poor testimony to others. So if we come, and on a morning like this morning, we prepare for the Lord's Supper. We come to take the Lord's Supper. But, what, but we gossip while we're here 
we're desecrating the Lord's Supper. We're betraying the truth that we're seeking to proclaim. It's often called communion, and it's to represent our community in Christ. The fellowship that we have with one another, as 1 John says, which is all tied directly to our fellowship individually with Jesus Christ. That's what gives us our body of communion.